I'm Laura Gelfand, head of the Department of Art and Design, and I'd like to take a moment to recognize some of the people who have made Carrie Mae Weems' visit possible, um, as well as this Visiting Artists series. The Communitas series, as some of you know, features artists, designers, and scholars whose lives and work promote the values of equality, diversity, and togetherness. The series has been funded by the Marie Eccles Kane Foundation Russell Family, the Department of Art and Design, and the differential tuition contributed by every student enrolled in classes in the Kane College of the Arts. This year-long series is the department's signature event for USU's Year of the Arts celebration. I'm also grateful to Dr. Craig Jessup, Dean of the Kane College of the Arts, for his help with PR and marketing for tonight's lecture, and Dr. Raymond Vion, who first reached out to Ms. Weems and got this ball rolling. Now, please welcome Assistant Professor of Contemporary Art, Dr. Marissa Vigneault, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Oh, thank you. So <laughs> All right, well, it's my absolute pleasure this evening to be able to introduce Carrie Mae Weems to you. Carrie began her artistic career as a photographer, an observer of society, including family relationships, cultural identity, sexism, class, political systems, and the consequences of power. Working from that initial photographic impulse and often putting herself literally into her pictures, Carrie has expanded her practice to include text, fabric, audio, digital images, installation, and video. The professional accolades surrounding Carrie and her work are plentiful. She has received numerous awards, grants, and fellowships, and I only mention a few here. The prestigious Prix de Roma, the National Endowment for the Arts, and Anonymous Was a Woman. In 2012, Carrie was presented with the U.S. Department of State's Medals of Arts, and in 2013, received the MacArthur Genius Grant, as well as the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's Lifetime Achievement Award. In addition, Carrie has accepted the W.E.B. E. Du Bois Award from Harvard University, as well as honorary degrees from California College of the Arts, Colgate University, Bowdoin College, the School of Visual Arts, and Syracuse University, which is the city where she currently resides and just happens to be the place where I was born. Artist and curator Mary Jane Jacobs, writing on Weems' work Ritual and Revolution, stated, quote, her work speaks to human experience and of the multiple aspects of individual identity, arriving at a deeper understanding of humanity, end quote. And in these often inhumane times, I think there is no more important question for an artist to address than our shared and collective humanity. So please help me in welcoming Carrie Mae Weems to Utah State University. Thank you so much. My goodness, look at this audience. Laura, thank you for, this, for your great generosity, kindness, just really a lovely human being. Thank you for coming. I know that you're all busy. You have many, many, many other things to do besides hanging out with me. I thought I'd talk with you about just a few things in relationship to the work that I'm making and how I make it and so forth. So, but before I start, um, let me just see a show of hands because I'd like to know who I'm talking to. Um, how many of you are actually artists? A show of hands for the artists that are in the audience. Ah, many, 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 many. Um, historians and architects, designers, ah, great, history majors, scientists, Geologists, um, one of the things that uh, I've spent a lot of time doing um, for much of my creative life is really paying attention to what other artists do. Writers, filmmakers, photographers, designers, architects scientists, historians. And I also think a lot about the essay of influence. 
All of us, in one way or another, are influenced by something. We are all in a very particular kind of context. And what that influence is has always interested me, and I spent a lot of my time thinking about what art, other artists do and how they do it. I've, like you know, read people like Toni Morrison and Tolstoy literally on my knees. So extraordinary was their work and is their work. I remember, I remember reading um, Anna Karenin for the first time, and, uh, and I, it was through reading that I really began to really understand the extraordinary power of the arts. So I was reading this book, I was sitting in Newhall, California, which is where CalArts is, I graduated from CalArts. I'm sitting in my bedroom, I'm reading Anna Karenin, and I'm reading this great, great, great chapter about this horse race that was taking place. And, and I remember feeling that I was the horse, and that I was the wind, and that I was a skirt, and I was a spur. I mean, right, right. And when I, when I finished reading this passage, and I realized that I was none of those things, but I was Carrie Mae Weems sitting in a room in New Hall, California, I put down that book, and I think I applauded for about five minutes to myself. I thought, oh, this is what great art is that it has the power of transporting you to another kind of place, making us aware of our own human possibility, our own capacity, and our capacity to be far more than we usually think ourselves to be. Alice um, um, Waters uh, Walker uh, wrote this really, really great book called In Search of Our Mother's Garden. And I go back to that book again and again and again. And I'm really just sort of showing you the artists that I come back to again and again and again and how they've influenced me, how I think about them. Pina Bausch, who's been really important to me. Frank Sinatra, who's been really important to me. Next to Nina Simone, right? And br bringing those two things together. And I spend a lot of time also sort of thinking about how other artists have influenced other artists, right? How other artists have influenced other artists, that you have to see what other artists are doing and that they are shaping one another, they are pushing against one another, they are reliving the experience of one another and broadening that experience in extraordinary ways. One of my favorite photographers is Roy Di Carava. I come back to his, his work again and again. And Duchamp, of course, has been really important to me. And I didn't know how important until much later in my life. I think of this as being one of the great fades. And then people like Martin Purrier. This, this piece, actually, this piece comes up again in my work over and over. And for those people who are sculptors, I remember seeing Martin Purrier's exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art several years ago. And it was the, it was, it's the only exhibition that I've ever been in when people literally walked around almost in a daze, just, just sort of looking, you know? And it, it, was just, it was just this sort of incredible, incredible visceral, experience. Even the guards, the guards were coming up to me saying, did you see that piece over there? Go look at that. You know, I mean, it was just amazing. Now, a few years ago, I started working on this project. It's called Grace Notes, Reflections for Now. And, uh, and I'd been struggling with the meaning, the ideas, and the terms of, of the term grace. What, 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 what does that mean? What does that mean? And so uh, uh, I struggled with it for a long time. I still don't have an answer, really. You know, I just keep sort of digging because I think that that's what we do as artists. We don't necessarily have to have the answer, but we certainly have to have some of the right questions. And for me at this moment in time, it had to do with grace and how to talk about that and how to present it, how to write it. Uh, and then one night, a couple of months ago, I went, to, I went to sleep. Actually, it was in August. I went to sleep with this question on my mind, and I'm thinking about a performance that's coming up. I've been doing performance a bit in the last couple of years, and um, struggling with this idea. I went to sleep, and in the middle of the night, 
I had this sort of extraordinary dream where this vast tsunami was coming, threatening to, to just wipe us all out. And I started running in this dream. I was running and I was running and I was trying to inform my, my friends. And of course, I was trying to get away. I was trying to save my life, but I wanted to also save my friends and to warn them that this huge wall of water was coming and threatening to destroy us. And then I ran, and I looked over to my right, and there was Trump looking at me. <laughs> Trump looking at me. And I ran past Trump. I'm screaming to my friends. And then finally, I get to Martin Puryear's ladder. And my friends were climbing this ladder. And they were all singing. We are climbing Jacob's Ladder. Not as a, not as a, as a hymn, but much more as a, a sort of a, a protest song, right? We are climbing Jacob's Ladder. We are climbing Jacob's Ladder. Right. This is my dream. <laughs> right, I, I wake up, this dream knocks me out of my sleep. Right? And I, I, I didn't want to wake up my husband. I remember running out onto my balcony into the night and I was saying, oh, whoa, thank you. Thank you. Right? That if you consider some of the right questions, right, if you consider them, if you dig deep, for them, that something will come up. And that a number of the kinds of questions that I have about what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to speak to uh, through my life and through the work that I make, is always answered when I am most relaxed and I am in that sort of in-between zone, allowing my body to tell me what it needs and allowing me to get out of the way of the work so that the work can tell me what it needs to be. It's one of the hardest things that we do. Often we find ourselves as artists sort of pushing, trying to push through, every, trying to push through, right? Struggling constantly to sort of make something happen. And it's not coming together because you're all tense and you're all tight and you can't think clearly. But when you allow yourself to simply let your work speak to you and let your body speak to you, then something else comes up that I think is powerful and important. Felix Gonzalez Torres is one of my favorite artists. A sort of beautiful sense of materiality, how to use material. This man at the end of his life a young man at the end of his life, trying to figure out how to deal with what was going on in his body as AIDS began to sort of ravage it, right? Using curtains, right? You know, red and white beaded curtains and asking us individually to pass through that, right? Representing blood cells, red and white blood cells, right? Shifting and turning, right, as his body is going through what it's going through as he faces his own demise, right? The sort of incredible, elegant way that he presented these ideas to us and for us. And so this idea of living with other artists, of thinking about what other, what other artists do is really important to me. I think about them. I get up early in the morning to read about them or to look at their films or to just process what other artists are doing. And other artists are always assisting me in making the kind of work that I make. Right? Again, thinking about myself in context, thinking about myself as a, as a figure who is working with and in concert with other artists, even when I'm working alone. 
I mean, his ideas about influence have influenced, of course, any number of other artists. Other artists are returning to various aspects of art history, digging in that soil in order to figure out who they are in relationship to that work, that practice now. Right? And we're always doing it. For instance, this sort of wonderful work with Micheline, right? I never knew, for instance, that Duchamp was really relying on Corbier's um, work. And then I use that work in another body of work, this idea of this sort of the ushering into the world. And what happens in that painting, in those paintings, and that idea of, of woman much later in the 20th century. So these ideas about influence, I think, are really important. Being aware students and faculty and staff, right? What are you influenced by? What are you motivated by? What are you committed to? And what is the nature of that commitment? What are the things that get you up in the morning? What are the kinds of questions that you're asking yourself about your practice and about the world around you and the relationship of your practice and relationship to the world around you? What do you want your work to be? How do you want your work to speak? And the work that I do, I bring together uh, not only, uh, I'm deeply concerned with my own practice. You know, I'm very, very, very selfish, right? But I'm also really interested in what other artists do, and I also convene other artists. And so I've done a number of convenings over the years. Um, uh, the, oh, a, a major one several years ago at the Guggenheim, which is a five-day experience of bringing maybe together about 180 artists. Amazing. It's online. It's still available. You can still see it called Past Tense, Future Perfect. This idea of using language to sort of underscore the ideas that I'm working with. And then most recently, uh, several weeks ago, convening uh, a major um, uh, project of about 100, no, 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 about 70 artists, about 70 artists at the Park Avenue Armory. You know, one of the things that I realized at a certain point, uh, I was talking with other students about this uh, today, at a certain point was that I realized that, you know, I have a very particular kind of project and I have a very particular kind of practice. And so that no matter what I'm doing, what I'm making, right, what I've discovered about myself through looking at the work and paying attention to what I'm always returning to, is that I'm deeply interested in sort of questions of power. So, so, so this piece of the Kitchen Table series, which I made long, long, long ago, had to do with the relationship of, 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 of women to women, of women to children, of women to men, you know, questioning ideas about family, about tradition, about democracy, I mean, about power. And it occurred to me at a certain point that much of my work much of my work has really negotiated and deals with the sort of issues of power, and I enter that in a number of different ways through much of the work that I do. I'm interested in power, the, the way in which power corrupts, and I'm interested in the history of violence and how we negotiate that, uh, and how I negotiate that specifically in my work. I'm very much interested in, uh, um, in tone, and texture and color and using using those ideas those those this this sort of um, these notions as a way of grounding the work and grounding myself in a in a particular space of habitation and asking my audience to somehow join with me coming back to the question Standing on shaky ground, I opposed myself for a critical study, but I was no longer certain of the questions to be asked. Representation. It was clear that I was not Manet's type, and Picasso, who had a way with women, only used me, and Duchamp, who I absolutely love, never even considered me. But it could have been worse. Imagine my fate had de Kooning gotten hold of me. 
you know, and just sort of using, using, using the, and these ideas about repetition. You know, how do we use repetition in the, in the work to explore, to investigate, to underscore, to build tone and rhythm and sound, which is what we do as artists, right, through a number of different methods. And then paying attention again to how the work leads. One project is always leading you to the next. And again, if you are aware of your practice, right? And if you can get out of the way of the practice, it tells you what it needs to be. Everything is connected. All of the work that you do is interconnected. So I made this piece about Duchamp and about painting and about, about, about the history of painting. Right? And about the ways in which certain people have been left out of the history of painting. Right? Again, negotiating these sort of questions of power. Then I was asked by, um, uh, when Robert Colescott represented the United States at the Venice Biennale, um, I was asked by Robert to do his portrait. And so I knew that he didn't want a traditional portrait or he wouldn't be contacting me, right? I mean, you don't contact me for a tr traditional portrait. But I just made this work, right? I just made this work, and so it made absolute sense that I would start to sort of investigate the same kinds of ideas with Robert Colescott, and so I made this triptych. Seduced by one another and yet bound by certain social conventions, you framed me and I framed you, but we were both framed by modernism. And even though we knew better, we continued that time-honored tradition of the artist in his model. Right? Again, sort of coming back over and over and over to these ideas and the ways in which we are also complicit at times in our own victimization. Right? Right? That we are aware of what we're participating in. How do we participate in what happens to us? And so I'm always interested in uh, these sort of layers of meaning inside of meaning inside of meaning inside of meaning and kind of building on that and using, you know, again, um, levels of language, of tone, of repetition, of understanding that each thing is connected to the next thing and the sort of exploration that I am trying to go through as an artist in looking at the work that I make. From here I saw what happened and I cried it was a very, very important work that I made um, several years ago. I mean, this is like an old work too. Um, you know, I'm getting so old. Um, it's, um, it was a piece that, um, this piece was actually commissioned by the Getty. I love uh, actually working on com you know, commissions because then I can do exactly what I want to do and get paid. Um, but it was an important project, and, 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 and it raised any number of issues. There were all these issues around appropriation. There was issues. There were issues around um, my use of materials that were coming out of other archives. I used these pieces that came out of Harvard's archive. Harvard at a certain point decided that they were going to sue me for using these images. And then I thought, well, that would be interesting. They should, right? Because we needed to have kind of a, an, a, a sort of a, an open discussion, an open dialogue around sort of the nature of appropriation and how appropriations happen and how we use appropriation contemporarily, right? And then finally Harvard decided that they weren't going to sue me. And then they decided that they would buy the piece from me. So I didn't know what to do. And this happened maybe 25 years ago, but people are still talking about this piece. People are writing about this piece. There's a big uh, book that's coming out in a few months around this piece. Uh, there are, have been concerts launched around this piece. I mean, it's really been very, very interesting. It's raised some very, very interesting problems around the kind of work that I do. The piece consists of maybe, maybe 35, photographs, and, um, and I produced it in 1995. But I realized at a certain point, this is something also that I think is interesting about the role of, of artists and the role of art and what art can do and how it can summarize, that I could have left the piece with just these four pieces. 
again, if I'm thinking about really the steep nature of the history of representation and power, the power of photographs to reveal. You became a scientific profile, a Negroid type, an anthropological debate, and a photographic subject. I mean, there's this sort of, you know, this deep, 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 deep compression of meaning, of language, just, just, just sort of anchored through just these four photographs. And then what goes on with the other 30, 30 uh, images is kind of a, an unpacking of this sort of very particular history. It was an interesting work. I learned a great deal from it had amazing conversations with artists, artists who, uh, whom I, I, I have a great deal of respect for and I love and I've uh, you know, worshipped uh, them and their, and their work, to artists that I really didn't like that much at all. Ideas about color have always been anchored in my work as well. And I come back to it again and again and again, using these ideas about color, grids and systems uh, and things around identity and questions of identity and how to break through these sort of you know binaries that nothing is really black and white nothing ever is black and white there are always many many shades and tones in between all of the grades all of the grades all of the grades and so I come back to that idea often in my work I think that, you know, if most of us are honest with ourselves, one of the things that we realize is that um, almost from the very beginning of your creative lives and your sort of sophisticated lives as thinkers, understanding that you are your own entity, your own individual, that you are always asking yourself basically the same question about who you are and what you are now in this life, in this world that we live in. Right? You know, I, I go, to, go back to, to, to my diaries and I'm asking the same question over and over and over. I'm making the same statement over and over and over. It's always fascinating. But I have to write it. I have to mark it. I have to mark it and I think that that's also what I do in the work that I make, trying to find ways to mark it and to describe it, uh, to think about uh, the way in which architecture functions, how architecture functions in spaces of power. So, um, I, I, you know, I've gone through uh, the coast of Africa looking at the ways in which power and the sl slaveocracy worked, what it described, how architecture describes and reveals. It talks to us in really profound ways, right? You know, I made these photographs, you know, in, in uh, uh, Genève, this great, great, great African uh, city not far from Timbuktu. And, and the architecture, the architecture was so specific. I mean, it told me who belonged in a space, right? The sort of femaleness of a building told me about who belonged in the space. The maleness of the architecture told me who belonged in the space. It was encoded in the architecture itself, laid bare for everybody to see. And we deal with that too in the United States, but we do it slightly differently. So I've used myself often in my work, and I didn't know, I didn't know for a long time, I really did not know that I was performing. And it occurred to me much later in my life that I had been actually performing for the camera in a number of ways. I always, 99% of the time, I photograph on my own by myself. And a few years ago, I went to Rome. I'd always wanted to go to Rome. I've been wanting to go to Rome, you know, since I was about, you know, I don't know, maybe about 10 when I saw Gidget Goes to Rome. <laughs> Gidget Goes to Rome. And I, you know, I sort of imagined myself, you know, like, you know, riding around on, you know, on the, on the back of somebody's Vespa, you know, some cute Italian boy. And the only thing that I wanted to do really was to sort of have sex and have fun. <laughs> you know, eat pasta. 
But you know, but I didn't go to you know to, to, to Rome until much much ma- later in my life, and it was actually a good thing because I I actually got an amazing amount of work done. You know, like you know, first of all, I needed to really understand the role of architecture. I mean, this idea, right? This idea that I'm interested sort of like in structures of power. Right, in structures of power that, that, that I really actually absolutely needed to be in the city of Rome to understand the role of architecture in relationship to the body. Right? The relationship of architecture in relationship to the body. People build buildings so that you understand your relationship to that thing, right? You know, whether it's you know in ancient Rome or in Mussolini's Rome or in Hitler's Rome or in or in uh, 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 Frank Gehry's um, uh, uh, building. So I spent a lot of time sort of looking at this architecture, understanding plazas and places, going to, uh, again, you know, I spent a lot of time in ancient Rome. I went to all the gates. I photographed myself at all of the gates. And I would leave my house every morning about, you know, five, so that I would be the first person on the street, right? And I would be wherever I needed to be by first light so that I could be in a place without being disrupted because I was photographing myself. Right? My camera is set up in the middle of the street. I've got to figure out how to move around. And I've got to figure out how to move around fairly quickly. But how is the individual made to feel in relationship to the state, in relationship to the church, in relationship to neo-fascism? How are you made to feel as you approach a building? And then, as I was saying before, just as I was sort of finishing up this, 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 this project, just as I was, you know, I, I spent like a year in Rome, so I made all of these photographs, you know, many, 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 many photographs, and then I also shot at Cinecitta, which was great, which is where Fellini made all of his movies, and, and my studio was next door, and it was so exciting, and I loved every minute of it. It was just great. I made a little film called Italian Dreams. But just as I was sort of, sort of finishing up this work, I, I went to this site. I went to the National Gallery, the National Museum in Rome, and I made this photograph in front of a museum. And, and, suddenly, and suddenly, all of these ideas about what museums were, what, me, what a museum is, and how a museum functions, kind of took over. Right? So, you know, so I, I, I literally left the scene, I went home, I got on the phone, I decided that I was going to go throughout Europe as quickly as I could, photographing every museum that I could in every city that I wanted to be in, right, for about three weeks, just running around. So I threw like a toothbrush, my camera, a couple of pair of underwear, some jeans, you know, in a bag, and I just, and I just took off and made these photographs, you you know, again, sort of bearing witness, using my own body to bear witness to the role of the museum, thinking about who's in and who's out, and why are they in and why are they out, and what does it mean to be inside of a museum, and what do these institutions represent? What do they represent historically, and what do they represent now? And the changing role of museums as we sort of move through a new facet and a new time and a new era where we're asking museums to sort of stand up in a different kind of way, to organize in a different kind of way, to show work in a different kind of way. And then from there, right, from making these kind of this, this huge statement about museums um, start, went to the nation's capital to think about the role of myself in relationship in my body in relationship to Lincoln's monument and Jefferson's monument and the Washington monument. You know, and so, this, so this work, this work that started, you know, I don't know, you know, maybe 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more, I think maybe more than 10 years ago, has just sort of, you know, propelled me propelled me around the world because I'm really interested in architecture and I'm interested in what the power of architecture, what architecture stands for and how to use the body in relationship to that architecture, right? You know, that is my project. And so no matter where I go, I'm always doing this thing. There was a, there was a, a, a time uh, I, I make many different kinds of things, and I make different kinds of work. And you know, again, I'm doing sort of performance and uh, 
you know, I'm making video, and uh, I, you know, I direct, and I produce, and I'm not particularly good at them, but I do it anyway. I'm trying to work out a series of ideas, work through a series of problems, a series of questions. This idea about the history of violence that has um, pressed, that has been pressed on me and pressed into the work is something that I began to really come to grips with again only a few years ago. I mean, I knew that I was interested in certain formations, but I could not necessarily articulate it, right? I would sort of move around it, but I couldn't quite articulate it. Then I did a project with a group of students um, at um, SCAD. And I decided that I wanted to make a piece called Constructing History. This idea that we do construct things, right? That we build things, we make things, that we form a certain kind of reality through the work that we make. It's all a construction. It's all a perception. And in, in the process, as I started to sort of work on this thing about constructing history, I thought that, you know, again, I was resting. It was in a dream. And I'd had this um, dynamic conversation with a number of artists around the issue of representation and uh, appropriation. And so I decided that I should simply do a set of constructions, of reconstructions of famous photographs that were based on um, assassinations and killings in the country. And so, Kent State. And I realized that in large measure that the way in which we've arrived at this particular historical moment in time, like the, this very present now, had to do with a series of assassinations that happened in the country. Right? The assassination of Martin Luther King, we just celebrated his birthday. The assassination of Martin. The assassination of Malcolm. The assassination of Megger Evers. The assassination of Robert Kennedy. The assassination of Kennedy, of JFK. Right? You know, that, that, you know, again, and I've been talking with students about this a bit today, that this is sort of extraordinary, that we live in this, like, amazing democracy, this extraordinary country, and yet part of the way in which we've matured, the way in which we become who we are, is through a series of assassinations. We're not in Colombia, or Venezuela, or Chile, right? We're here. Right? And, yet, and yet, through our democracy, our democracy in some, some measure has been formed through a series of assassinations. <laughs> important to consider, important to understand how we arrive at a certain place. And so this idea about the histories of violence is something that fascinates me deeply and I return to it as a subject over and over and over. There are things that I've also been interested in in relationship to popular culture and the changing, changing dimensions of, of popular culture. What we see on TV and film in a way that we didn't see 20 years ago, five years ago even, right? That there's something that's going on, there's something in the zeitgeist, right? So that, you know, there's shows like Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder, Empire, right? Um, and so I decided that I would visit all those sets and photograph myself in relationship to those sets. And this is a, a small um, example of some of the pieces that I made uh, while um, on set at Empire. This is from Scandal. They're beautiful pieces. I really lo love working on them, love doing the work, uh, meeting the artist, being on set, seeing how things are made. And raising questions, which is what the text does. It raises questions about what we're seeing, what we're looking at, and being at Empire. Another thing from Empire. <clears throat> Empire was a very important, Empire has been a very important um, shift in television because of the way it began to use contemporary visual art in its making. 
right? And so it did something extraordinary with fashion, it did something extraordinary with architecture and design, and it did amazing things with contemporary visual art. And so that on every single wall, there's an important artist that we know, contemporary artist that we know of, that if you're aware, that you know of, that um, anchors, anchors the space. It's been really, really smart. Lee Daniels has done really an amazing, an amazing job. So these kinds of ways, this kind of practice, this using this, this uh, myself as a site and as a vehicle, as a way of bringing my audience along with me, has been something that I've been doing for a very, very, very long time. But as I said, I didn't always know that that's exactly what I was doing. My work also um, um, goes into um, social engagement, and I decided a few years ago that, that, you know, through a series of heinous crimes in my neighborhood, that I needed to figure out ways of bringing young people into the arts and into the field and helping them to negotiate uh, how they might work. And so I started an organization called the Institute of Sound and Style, which has turned into a nonprofit called Social Studies. And that's been sort of amazing. We do billboard projects and any number of projects, and we train students in visual arts and writing, photography, video, sound design, right? And this whole idea of being responsible for one's community became really important to me. And so I made these billboards and I put, the, put them up all around the city. And then I figured out ways to slip ideas into newspapers and community flyers so that when you got your flyer, you know, my stuff would just like fall out of the newspaper. Very, very cool. You know, so it's a wonderful way of getting ideas and work out into the world. These ideas about what's going on with young African American men has been, uh, uh, again, in relationship to state violence, has been absolutely important to me. And I've been doing this work uh, for, a, for a, a number of years as well. And again, you know, if, you, if, if, if I pay attention to my work, I'm aware of what I made. I, I become aware of what I made years ago. And so years ago, I started photographing young men in hoods, understanding that the hoodie was a problem, right? And it became a huge problem and a huge issue. And it's become even more profound in the last few years. So this idea about these suspects, these ideas about men, young boys, who pose a certain kind of visual threat uh, in society. And so this is a part of the last exhibition that I've done. It's been an important work, and I've used this work not only in relationship to um, this very particular still work um, in exhibition form, but I've also been using this work in relationship to another project that I developed called Grace Notes, which is a performance piece um, where I um, have engaged uh, an orchestra. I'm working with like a 26 uh, you know, piece orchestra with wonderful singers, an opera singer, a jazz singer, a blues singer, working with poets. And, and sort of incorporating, sort of incorporating all of these sort of ideas and things that I'm doing around the work, incorporating them in a sort of a single space in sort of real time. And it's been really a wonderful, wonderful way of working, though I'm not really interested in actors for the most part. I don't really like working with actors. You know, I mean, I really don't. I don't have the patience. Um, so, so I'm always in trouble. But it's been a really um, interesting process. Again, the project is called Grace Notes, and it was, you know, it came to me in the process of working on, um, you know, considering and thinking about how to address this sort of contemporary moment, right? And it really came home when I started thinking about the Emanuel Nine and how to think about the Emanuel Nine, this sort of group of people who were killed by Ruth in their church. How to think about Trayvon Martin and Eric Garner, how to think about them, how to, how to, how to really consider them. And so I made this piece called Grace Notes, Reflections for Now. We just presented it at the, at the Kennedy Center. The thing that became very interesting about working on this piece and the thing that I find interesting about working on work generally, 
Again, instead of I'm paying attention, you know, I begin to understand what I'm being influenced by, what I know, what is, um, um, what is lifting, lifting me up, what is carrying me, what the superstructure is, what my shit is based on. And I realized that I was actually telling the story of Antigone. It's really ultimately the story of Antigone. That this woman simply wants the right to bury her brother. And there is a community that is pushing back against that right to bury her brother. And so, you know, this idea about the nature of influence, the problems of influence, how we're influenced, understanding our context, understanding the role of what we make, understanding our own archive, understanding our own motivations becomes absolutely critical in getting to uh, understand your practice and how your practice can carry you forward. And so um, what I thought I would do, if you don't mind, we have like a few more minutes, I thought that I would um, show you just a couple of videos that actually come out of this piece so that you sort of see how I use um, visual images and moving images and text and sound um, in order to create that thing that we call um, texture. Is that okay? Yeah? So these, of course, are many stills from the project. <clears throat> the first piece that I'm going to show you, um, and I don't know, we, we may see the whole thing, we, we may not. It's a few minutes long. I think each of them are, oh, I don't know. It's 10 minutes or something. This is people of a darker hue. One of the things that I realized that I needed to deal with or the thing that I'm dealing with is uh, contemplating history. A woman stands in the thaw of winter, the beginning of spring, considering, reflecting, imagining, contemplating the past and imagining the future. With one step, she could be in the future in an instant or in the past, in the moment, the now. But to get to now, to this moment, she needs to look back over the landscape of memory. The role of memory on our work is key. According to time and place, your appearance changed, but you were always stopped, always charged, and always convicted. Imagine that you are always stopped, always charged, and always convicted. Imagine you or your child living under a constant state of fear, under constant pressure, suspicion. Imagine this, see this, imagine the impossible, Imagine the worst of the worst and know that it's happening. Imagine Trayvon Martin or Michael Brown. Imagine Eric Garner, Sandra Blaine, dying alone on the cold street and for no apparent reason. Imagine it. Think of it. Question for me, measure for measure, how do you measure a life? By what means, by what measure? Time and time again, the man was rejected and the woman was denied. The man was killed the body lay in the open, exposed. Women wailed and men moaned. For reasons unknown, I saw him running. 
I saw him stop. I saw him turn with raised hands. I heard a shot. I saw him fall. But for reasons unknown, I rejected my own knowledge and I refused to believe that it was possible. He was 18, he was a father, a boy, a brother, an uncle, a cousin, a husband. He was 36, he was 28, he was 25, she was 34, he was nine, she was 35, a wife, a mother, a sister, an aunt, a daughter, a cousin, a friend. He was 41. He was trying to get out his ID and his wallet out his um, pocket. And and the officer just shot him in his arm. We're waiting for a back. I will, sir. No worries. I will. What? He just shot his arm off. Told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand out. He had you told him to get his ID, sir, and his driver's license. Oh my god, please don't tell me he's dead. Please don't tell me my boyfriend just went like that. Keep your hands where they are, please. Yes, I will, sir. I'll keep my hands where they are. Please don't tell me this, Lord. Please, Jesus, don't tell me that he's gone. Please don't tell me that he's gone. Please, officer, don't tell me that you just did this. For reasons unknown, I saw him running. I saw him stop. I saw him turn with raised hands. I heard a shot, I saw him fall. Time and time again, the man was rejected and the woman was denied. A man was killed, his body lay in the open, uncovered and exposed. Women wailed and men moaned. I saw him winning. I saw him stop. I saw him turn with raised hands. I heard a shot. I saw him fall. For reasons unknown, I rejected my own knowledge. I deceived myself by refusing to believe that this was possible. So their rights were denied. And the people said little. And they did even less. This violence was not like it was in the movies. There were no fast cuts, no zooms, no pans, no close-ups. Reality happens in slow motion and in somber colors. So we ask this question. In this mystery of all mysteries, how do you measure a life? people for darker hue. And so 
my work centers on some of this. While we can, while we can consider the nature of what is and what will be, consider the ebb and flow of tides, the bliss of water ebbing and lapping at the shore. While we can, let's consider the wonders of the world. While we can, perhaps we will stand for something that will fall for anything. While we can, consider beauty, the beauty of life, the loveliness of a new woman, the slope of a woman's body, and the joy it brings without force. While we can, let us consider the long days and the restless nights, the vast yearnings of the lonely and the loss. Consider the deep despair of mothers and fathers when they lose their children much too soon. While we can, let us consider fixing what is broken, damaged, lost within ourselves and around. While we can, let us consider mood, indigo, or maybe even a love supreme, anchoring us to the rhythm of life in all its glory, and a peace that is yet unknown. Consider the depths of the mountains, the heights of valleys, protecting them before they are all washed away. Let us consider saving ourselves, our brothers and our sisters, small portion of the planet. Consider the fascinating wonders of the world and its extraordinary challenges. Consider the evidence of things unseen, the wonders of generosity, of grace. Consider grace, its meaning, and its purpose while we can. Thank you. So um, I suppose maybe maybe you'll bring up the house lights so we can maybe see one another. Um, I know that uh, it's a it's a lot, and um, but if you have any any questions for me or any thoughts that you'd like to share in the room, you are absolutely welcome. And if not, I completely get it. It takes a while to to sometimes to process. Maybe you'll think about it later and ask yourself the questions that you need to ask. So if there are no questions, yeah. <clears throat> Can you stand up, please? Um, I'm sorry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it mentions about um, physical discomfort uh -huh. with art. Uh -huh. How important do you feel that is to bring a message, like making the viewer feel discomfortable? I would imagine that you know that uh, a lot of work makes us uh, uncomfortable. That's what um, a lot of work does. And uh, this idea about discomfort, um, about engaging a work, about engaging the questions of a work, I think are really quite important. I mean, I, I have to think that um, people of a darker hue, for instance, is not the easiest thing to watch, right? That there's a great deal of discomfort in negotiating what's happening, what all of this means, what your relationship is to this moment in time. 
right? All of that, I think, produces a discomfort that I think is absolutely necessary because I think that what we're trying to get at is complicated and painful and difficult, and um, art is meant to uh, stretch us, stretch our imaginations and to stretch the breadth of our humanity and the focus and the depth of our, our dignity. So I think it's absolutely um, crucial and I'm always sort of teetering on the edge of, uh, of disaster. You know, and, and, and you know, and that this idea of you know trying to make work that I want to see, right? You know, that I really want to see, that I really need to see in order to understand what it is that I'm trying to get at, right? And so I really start by making a work for myself first and foremost, and then I think about the audience later. But making this piece and making people of a darker hue, it was hard to do. Right? It was hard to make. I mean, you know, I, we're watching people die. Right? We are like watching the ultimate form of violence. Right? You know, the, the ultimate denigration of a body. I mean, that's what we're watching. Right? So to edit that, to work with that, right? To dig in that, to sort of pull all that out and then edit it. And not only edit it once, but to come back to it again and again and again and again. What do I need from this, right? What do I carry forward? What do I leave out? Making these sort of aesthetic decisions about violence, right? Is a discomfort for me. And for the people, the young people that are working in my studio, you know, I mean, I really, we really work really hard, we work long hours, right? We're pulling this material, and you know, at the end of the day, sometimes my, my young assistant would just come out of the back room just, you know, in pieces, right? You know, so it wasn't like every day she could work on it or every day I could work on it because it was painful to do. So, yeah. It's hard. You know, and then, you know, these sort of levels of description of violence. How do you do that? How do you bring people close? How do you bring people close to the work so that they are willing to look at the work and not turn away from the work? That becomes that sort of, you know, the other, the other thing that you have to do, the other thing that you have to consider, right? Because as much as I do, of course, make the work for me, I have to, I have to find my purpose and my meaning in the work. I, of course, I, I want to share it with an audience, right? And I'm hoping that in sharing it with an audience, then that might generate a certain kind of dialogue, a certain kind of reflection, whether that dialogue happens with me, or it happens later with somebody else, or it happens in your own person, right? And we're all, in one way or another, as artists and designers and architects and all of that, we're all a story. Right? We're all doing exactly the same, the same kind of thing, but differently. And so the question always is, how do you enter, right? How do you enter this time, right? How do you enter the discourse? How do you, you know, what are the, the frames of your work, the frame of your idea, the frame of your interest, right? The frames of your motivation, right? And then how do you build, you know, how do you build a work and a practice and a life around that thing, right? I mean, that's what you're here for, most of you, to sort of figure out, right, how to do this difficult work that you have to do. And if you're, and, and the work is always difficult if you're asking yourself um, the right question, right? Because the right question, and you'll only know when it's the right question, the right question will keep you up night after night after night after night and will send you to your studio and to your desk day after day after day after day, and month after month, and year after year. And it's the thing that I really love about being an artist. And in that way, you know, I'm never tired. I'm never too tired to, like, work. I'm never too tired to consider the work. I'm never, I'm never, even when I'm exhausted, right? You know, I'm always interested in engaging the practice in some, some form or another. Sometimes I can only write, you know, I can't run around, you know. And now I'm, you know, like really thinking about the sort of history of violence in this huge exhibition that I'm putting together now that's going to take me a couple of years. I'm really excited about it. 
you know? And, you know, and again, if I pay attention to my own work, there, there are bodies of it that are already done. There are chunks of it that are already done. There are ideas that are already done, right? They need, now they need to be sort of woven together in another kind of way as I sort of set out this layout, this, 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 this series of, of exhibitions that I'm really interested in doing. And working, of course, with a, um, a group of artists around, around this idea, around the history of violence. You know, who will be my designer? Who will be my videographer? The, the kind of the team that I need to put together in order to make it happen. And of course, the artists that I simply want to show alongside of. Because I think that that's always so interesting when you decide that you want to work with a group of artists and you want to be in context and in concert with them, not, not separated from them, but you use the platform to build something that's bigger than yourself, right? Bigger, bigger than me. Carrie is just, you know, she's just that, you know? But building something bigger that we all can aspire to, and for, and struggle around is really exciting. So thank you very much. I would say let's go have martinis, but I think this is a dry town. <laughs> Peace, be well.